Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome back to the Oxford Union Smashing the Silo series. Now, Qualcomm's general counsel, Don Rosenberg, will be in discussion with Jeffrey Mann uh, about the political and economic challenges facing a global tech company in 2021. Thank you very much indeed to both of you. Don, thanks so much for giving us this time today. And um, I'd like to start with a, a question that sort of draws on this career of yours and ask you to reflect on how the environment for innovative technology companies has changed, or for that matter, the ways history repeats itself and, and it doesn't change over the last several decades. Competition policy and antitrust law have obviously been key recurring themes in your career, but I imagine the way they've played out, um, uh, who's doing the enforcing, what they're enforcing against, um, that those sorts of things have changed considerably. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how you've seen that evolve, and in, and in particular, how you think it affects the way companies like Apple, IBM, Qualcomm, and others uh, do business. Well, thank you, Jeffrey. Uh, I, I'm tempted to just get up and leave at this point because uh, that was such a glowing introduction. Uh, and you also uh, covered a lot of the history that, um, that uh, I could mention as well. So I'll, I'll, I'll leave a lot of that out. Um, <clears throat> Look, I, I joined IBM, as you said, in 1975. It was my first job out of law school. At the time, IBM only hired uh, uh, in their law department for, directly from law school. The notion was uh, they were going to create essentially an in-house legal function that was as good as any major uh, law firm and also train uh, lawyers to be IBM lawyers. Uh, and throughout that, uh, that long 31-year career, I was uh, moved probably every two and a half to three years to a different job, sometimes involving a different geographic location, uh, to get as much experience uh, within the business itself and, um, <clears throat> and to understand all aspects of the business and how the, the business was uh, engaged with all the legal issues that, that it would ultimately be engaged with. What was interesting is, as you said, I, I joined just as the trial began, uh, we didn't know, as, as you indicated, that it would last for another <laughs> another seven years, 13 years. And I found some, you, you did some research clearly. I, I found an interesting, two interesting quotes. One is from a uh, law professor named Robert Landy. Uh, this was quite a while ago. And he said that uh, this was the largest legal case of any kind ever filed. Uh, you pointed out the uh, statistics in terms of the amount of uh, documents, lawyers. Uh, unfortunately, I would say that uh, that was at that time the largest, but unfortunately, litigation, especially in the U.S., has, uh, has taken off. The other thing that I found was that Robert, Robert Bork, we all remember Robert Bork, called it the antitrust divisions Vietnam. <laughs> so uh, I, I think now I'm probably dating myself a little bit uh, talking about those names and, and uh, that history, but is very interesting. Um, but it, what what also isn't, and I know this is a lot of a lot of history for some of some of you listening. But what also isn't known uh, very well is that <clears throat> when I joined IBM, we were still uh, controlled essentially by what, what was called the 1956 consent decree. And every lawyer had to completely familiarize him or herself with that consent decree which was brought when uh, IBM was in the polarith card business and the very nascent stages of the computer data processing industry and resolved in 56 with this consent decree. And I may refer back to it again, but I'll tell you that just to jump ahead, one of my many jobs was managing litigation uh, for, for IBM for about 15 years. And in 1996, I oversaw saw the final sunsetting of that consent decree, 40 years uh, under a consent decree. Uh, and it says something to your question about uh, how things have evolved. Of course, now there are sunset clauses in decrees that uh, will sunset them a lot sooner than 40 years. Although still and, sometimes 20 years, right? I mean, yeah, it depends on, it depends on, but <clears throat> by the way, the other thing is it wasn't, really 40 years. It was 40 years when we finally got the uh, division and the court to agree. But 
but then it was a four to five year phase out period depending upon uh, the particular practice. And what's, what's really significant as I think back at that uh, time was this really controlled IBM in so many things that did. The reason the lawyers became so integral a part of IBM's business was because of this consent decree. In fact, it was 10 years after the decree was entered that the development of this in-house law department started. And then in 69, just as, just as uh, the suit was filed, uh, we hired, company hired, uh, Nick Katzenbach as the general counsel, which was another reason why I decided to go to, to Qualcomm, uh, to, excuse me, IBM at the time. Um, so what was it like? It was, um, we, were, we were dealing at the time, in the, now in the 70s and then into the 80s, we were dealing with a, uh, a perspective on antitrust that was looking again at concerns about monopoly power. And another thing, just point of history, the day in the New York Times, uh, the headline was about IBM case being dismissed for without merit. This was after 13, 13 years without merit. Uh, the same uh, day in the headlines was the AT&T breakup. Huh. Uh, had the government succeeded, it would have been the IBM breakup as well. <clears throat> um, so that was a, a focus. Now, a lot of people know and understand that starting then in the early 80s and uh, at that time, we were moving into away from mainframe dominance and, and into PC, the PC world. Uh, and um, there are lots of theories about why IBM, for example, uh, didn't enter quickly into the PC world, why IBM's position in mainframes was, um, was uh, diminished, uh, or at least its position in data processing was diminished because mainframes became less of, a, uh, of an important part of the data processing universe. Uh, by the way, over the years, we used to laugh internally at IBM. There was constant predictions of the death of the mainframe. <laughs> and it just kept going and going like the energizer. Has it happened yet? It still hasn't happened, but it's 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 getting close. Uh, I, I think IBM is is uh, having some interesting interesting times. I never thought, frankly, back when I worked for IBM, when I was general counsel, I had five hundred lawyers around the country, the country, and IBM was IBM, as you know, it started in nineteen eleven. Uh, Qualcomm now has, uh, I believe, uh, a, a higher market cap than, than IBM currently does. So and, things, and, and I want to know more or fewer lawyers. That's really the question. We have fewer lawyers than the 500. Uh, sure. uh, we, we have a lot of lawyers, but a lot of them are patent lawyers, uh, yeah. patent prosecuting lawyers uh, who work with our engineers because we are so focused on R&D and inventing. You know, Qualcomm still has 70% of its employees are engineers. Uh, that's another thing you pointed out that people don't know about Qualcomm. We are really, and have been for some time, the research and, and develop the R&D arm of a lot of the industry. The device makers that uh, exist everywhere now, and we only know of a few in the US, you look at China, there are probably 200 or more. Um, and of course, uh, Korea, uh, Japan, all those device makers, would not have come into existence, or at least as soon as they did, without the uh, inventions that IBM, uh, excuse me, that Qualcomm created uh, and then patented and shared through the licensing program, which has gotten, as you know, a bad name on occasion. But in fact, it was the um, primary uh, mover of huge entry into the, uh, into the mobile communications arena. Uh, so um, how did how did antitrust law uh, develop? It's been very interesting for me. I, I think you put your your finger on what I see really, which is um, almost kind of the more things change, the more they remain the same. I, I've seen in so many aspects of my career, which has now spanned 45, 46 years, um, reasons to say, you know, we've been there before. It's just a big circle. <laughs> Uh, sometimes the terminology is different. Clearly the players are different. If I look back at the 20 some odd private lawsuits that were being filed against us that we were dealing with during the course of the, uh, the uh, US um, uh, DOJ 
uh, litigation. You could look back at the names. I Most of the people on this call would not even recognize the names. The, the companies are gone, not because, by the way, they were put out of business by IBM, but as we said over and over again, it was true. A lot of them were destined to be left in the, in the dustbin of history, so to speak, because they hadn't kept up with developments and, and innovation. And right. that's been one of my themes in responding defensively to um, uh, monopolization, uh, competition law claims over the years, which is that you, you want to, yes, I don't, I don't disagree. We need regulation. We need to, we need to be concerned about the potential for abuse, um, the potential for the possibility of, of um, monopolization to the point where um, uh, entry is limited and, and innovation is limited. But um, it should be um, very carefully measured. And most importantly, it should be careful not to interfere with the innovative process, which I, I do worry about quite a bit. And then, of course, in 2000, talk about repeating, we had the Microsoft um, litigation. So they, they started. Uh, and, and that was an interesting one that I was involved in. I won't get into um, detail unless you want me to there. But um, um, there, too, it was more a question of uh, uh, what they were doing to abuse their so-called monopoly position in terms of, um, I would say, forcing use of uh, certain of their products along with their, with their primary products. I think I may have gotten off off um, well off your point here, but no, no. I actually, I mean, I'll 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 ask a sort of follow up that I think will help. I I, I thought it was particularly interesting the the point you made about um, sort of how the uh, the development of the <clears throat> the ethos of the legal team at IBM related to the the litigation and regulation environment and. And interestingly, you could probably say that it turned out to be a sort of unintended benefit for the, the company. Um, I doubt it outweighed the cost, though. Um, and I'm, <clears throat> and <clears throat> excuse me, you mentioned making sure, sort of, you know, we need antitrust enforcement, but we need to make sure that it's it's properly uh, targeted. Um, and you talk about uh, uh, you know making sure it allows innovation to happen, um, but I. You know, I think I'd love to hear a little bit more about how it may impede innovation by the, the companies that are the, the target. So, so the enforcement takes place against a company like IBM or Qualcomm, ostensibly to ensure that other companies can uh, have the space to innovate. And that's, of course, important. But um, it also may impede innovation in unpredictable or, or uh, unfortunately, sometimes intentional ways uh, at the target company. Um, so I'm, I'm I'm curious how that happened, how you might have seen that play out at IBM. But I think it's in some ways more interesting uh, the way that might play out with respect to Qualcomm because of its um, you know re really innovation heavy and, and licensing based business model. Yeah. So so I would say um, first of all, the IBM is a perfect example. Um, enormous, as you referenced, enormous resources, not just um, money. Right. Uh, and lawyers, but the business, uh, the executive staff, everybody was impacted by uh, A, the consent decree, and B, the, the suit that went on for, for 13 years. Right. Everybody had to be carefully um, educated and watched because at the time, talk about the development of antitrust law, you know, you could find, plaintiffs could use a few interesting bad documents, we'll call them, to suddenly paint a picture that um, fit within someone's conception of what um, abusive behavior might be, right? Yeah. And the, often the uh, regulators and the courts were more interested in that kind of um, picture painted by internal memoranda than really examining the facts, the effects, and the economics, uh, and that was a that was a big issue. I remember going around the com company in my early days lecturing. I, I had major I had major audiences of employees. It was a regular process where I would not only explain the limitations imposed on us by the consent decree, 
but I, was, I would also explain how poor language could um, cause great damage beyond anything you could imagine. Um, right. um, loose lips, of, you know, just expressing things in ways that really when you thought about them are not intended, but, but and it got worse by the way, when email started to pick up. Sure. And now of course, and I remember lecturing back in, uh, in the eighties, a group saying, you know, and I was pointing to Microsoft at the time, I said, they're gonna have trouble eventually because of the way they express themselves in addition to maybe some practices. Right. And I was, I was telling people about the then fairly nascent regular use of, of email. I'm sorry, I'm aging myself a lot. But <laughs> I said, you know, you have to remember, a lot of you are typing with your fingers as if you're talking on the telephone. Yeah. You're just saying the things that come to your mind and you're typing them away. You don't think of that as something that you're creating a document or you thought through very well. Or you're just kind of throwing ideas out. That will become a document. In, in litigation at some point. That, because you're writing it down, emails will be uh, discoverable and they will be produced. And uh, I was trying to explain to people that I'm not saying don't tell the truth, but think about what you're saying in writing and think about the, the implications uh, or how they could be misinterpreted and, and, and misused. So, uh, yeah. I, I just, I, do, do you think that that, having to overlay that way of thinking uh, affects uh, someone's ability to, to manage others or, or to do their job effectively. I, this may not be something you really think about and, and maybe it's, maybe it's silly, maybe, you know. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I raise it. So we, uh, you know, it's not, it's not a major, a major issue. I was using it as an example of, yeah, of course. how um, we had to go through this process of educating uh, engineers and uh, finance people, um, and it was just this entire overlay on which, which of course increased, uh, as I say, the, um, the time spent on things that weren't directly associated with what they were supposed to be doing, which was either developing or, or managing the business. Sure. Um, so, so I could now bringing that to the, the current um, state of affairs, uh, I would say, and I would say this, whether I was speaking as a Qualcomm advocate or not, we, we, Qualcomm, <clears throat> have really been uh, terrific at managing through all the issues that you, that you mentioned, the challenges that we've had from so many regulatory agencies. Right. Um, and frankly, in part, it, it comes from the belief that we were doing the right things as opposed to the wrong things. And the big issue for us was, unfortunately, I think, um, not educating uh, the public and the, and the the regulators. I'm, I'm also, I also run the government affairs organization worldwide at Qualcomm. And one of the things that, that I've done in the 13 or so years I've been there is really reach out um, uh, way beyond where we have been to talk about the Qualcomm model. In particular, it's been licensing because that's been largely the, the area of the business that has been uh, vilified. Qualcomm, Qualcomm has really has managed through the challenges um, yeah, the, there is definitely resource, um, unnecessary resource expended on, on a lot of things associated with defending ourselves. Right. On the other hand, um, it really helps to educate uh, the organization and to really, it, it ended up actually building a um, really good sense of just how valuable the company's um, activities are. Engineers in particular, they love to hear about our ability to convince regulators or courts that, no, this was all about innovation. Uh, there was nothing anti-competitive about this. Um, these people worked very hard to invent and patents, which is not a subject of this, of this uh, discussion, but patents isn't a bad word. Patents is a, is a very important, patents are a very important element of the innovation economy that we're all in, as, as we've seen, because the rest of the world is catching up Absolutely. to uh, the U.S. as a protection of intellectual property. Um, so um, we've been, we've been um, burdened, but it hasn't stopped us from continuing to innovate. 
What, what do you, uh, I, I do want to talk a little bit about the, the patents. I don't think it's a, irrelevant here in any sense. Um, uh, in particular, because um, as you suggest, I, I suspect the, the role of patents has something to do with the sort of misunderstanding of, uh, of Qualcomm's business model. And, um, and I, I suspect that a lot of uh, listeners may not know the nature of the, the antitrust um, actions against Qualcomm, which, which you can't, I don't think you can really separate from the patenting and licensing business. So maybe you could talk about that uh, just a little bit because I mean, in my mind, um, it, is, it is the technology that Qualcomm has patented and licensed that, um, you know, is the, the sort of most incredible output of the company. Uh, I, don't, I wouldn't say that to the semiconductor folks, but you know, the, the technology is pretty amazing and important. And, um, and somehow I think um, it may not be hear me? easy for the general public, but also perhaps regulators to, to understand how to um, regulate, I guess. I, that's a technical question, but you. Yeah, yeah. no, so, so, you know, we, we talked about antitrust and, but there's, uh, you know, a very common uh, refrain about the intersection between antitrust and intellectual property law. And I've kind of lived on that intersection right. uh, my whole career, frankly. I, I would say I've spent as much time on intellectual property issue as I have on antitrust issue. Sure. And that was at IBM as well when um, I, I cut my teeth on copyright law when the question of whether software is copyrightable was a major point of discussion. Yeah, wow. We're uh, going to have to have another session spent, on that. I spent a lot of time on that, including sitting at council table in the Supreme Court of the United States for one of the cases that, uh, that um, was brought then with respect to uh, just to what extent uh, copyright law protects software. Um, yeah, I mean, patents have been, and in particular, something called standard essential patents have been uh, a big issue in all of our competition, most of our, uh, most of our competition challenges. Um, uh, and it goes basically to the question of, are we, uh, are we charging too much for the right to use our patents? That's one of the major issues. Um, and then um, it also goes to uh, whether or not we have the right to restrict use of our inventions under certain circumstances. On the first point, what, what has always uh, disturbed me is that really at, at bottom, trying to regulate through competition law, the prices or the royalty rates of our patents is price regulation. Uh, it, that's been the basis of our challenges in most places around the world. Uh, China, for example, in 2013, we, we um, dealt, we were, we were um, an investigation by what was then the NDRC, um, was investigating our licensing practices. But it was, it was straightforward. Their anti-monopoly law, which was fairly new in 2009, um, had a specific provision in it that said it, it, they can regulate um, high, high prices. Uh, as you know, the U.S. The, yeah, the U.S. and Europe don't don't have that kind of that's that's direct price regulation. And I would argue uh, that really what was involved in that NDRC investigation was an attempt to essentially lower our royalty rates, which is price price regulation. And there's a lot of other things to say about that, including uh, ultimately how we were able to resolve uh, that with the Chinese authorities, and and things have worked out fairly well. Um, but even, even you look at um, their current, uh, the SAMR says right in its title, it's, it's a market regulation um, uh, agency. What's interesting is the US constantly denies, US regulators, I'll throw a little shot at them, mm -hmm. uh, constantly deny that, oh no, it's, nothing, it's not about price regulation. If you look at our FTC case that you referenced, that was a price regulation. Case. Right. They would never call it that, of course, but that's that's what it was all about. In fact, it went beyond that. Um, 
they really tried at every turn to take an interpretation of facts, which were often incorrect, and try to squeeze them into some acceptable antitrust theory, right up to the point of bringing the case. I mean, the, the, the case was ill-conceived for a lot of reasons, including the fact that facts, they had the facts wrong yeah. um, and the economics of it, um, but that the, there was no slot in which to, uh, you could um, properly fit the theory uh, from an antitrust law perspective. And that, in part, is a big part, I think, is where they ended up getting hung up with the Ninth Circuit, as you referenced, terrific uh, decision, not just the decision itself, but the opinion, uh, unanimous, by the way, three-judge panel, um, really, really got to the bottom of what was associated, what, what was in that, in that case, both from a factual perspective and a, and a Technical perspective and economics perspective, and 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 I was very heartened by that panel's uh, opinion there, and of course, uh, then a uh, an attempt to bring an on bond proceeding uh, failed, and not one judge on the Ninth Circuit, which is the biggest court of appeals circuit in the U.S., um, agreed to hear rehear the case. By the way, we're we're still waiting. Uh, end of this month is when the uh, time uh, expires for the FTC if they choose to, to seek cert, cert uh, that is Supreme Court review of right. uh, the Ninth Circuit's case. I think it would be fairly ill-conceived for a lot of reasons that they would do that, but that's still, a, that's still an, an option. Uh, for them. I, uh, I think it's interesting to think about, um, you, you mentioned the FTC's theory, um, and and I don't think it's unique to them, uh, being essentially one of price regulation and trying to fit that into the acceptable antitrust uh, doctrine. Um, and uh, there are actually a lot of complaints about antitrust that it's sort of, sort of too heavily focused on on price, and among other things, it should focus more on innovation. Um, in a, in a kind of ironic way, it seems like you could you could make exactly that complaint about the FTC enforcement action. That, in a sense, it's uh, it, not in the way most people mean it, but I think it's important here that um, uh, it, it's almost. I, I think I raised this before. They they may have been concerned with innovation, but if they were, they were only thinking about the ability of um, of counterparties to innovate. And uh, I don't think taking proper account of how Qualcomm innovates, and then again, in particular, how its business model, the, the price that it charges um, isn't just a you know, random price. It is, of course, has a lot of factors that go into it, but, but of course, those revenues are, are what fuel Qualcomm's R&D and the massive amount of innovation that happens there. Um, exactly. Maybe it's hard. I get that it's probably hard for regulators to take account of that, but but shouldn't they? And, and absolutely, and are they properly doing so? Absolutely, as you said, we we have what I like to call a, a, a virtuous cycle of um, inventing, patenting, licensing, and then using the royalties from the licensing to reinvest in research and development. We we spend consistently over 20% of our revenue or turnover on research and development, which is enormous in terms of percentage compared to most other companies in our industry and most other industries. Um, yeah, the, the, the complaints, both the FTC and others, were really focused on the concerns about a few major companies who were, I mean, when you think about it, in the, in the US, there are three device makers really for all intents and purposes. I mean, there are edges here, but 90% are Apple, Samsung, and LG. Now, A, one could argue that US competition authorities shouldn't be overly concerned about Samsung and LG, but you know, fine, they're doing business here. B, Apple, the, the, um, the uh, most, uh, certainly the biggest company in terms of market cap, in the in the world, uh, lead doesn't really need much help. Um, the other thing I'd say, just just uh, not get too far in the weeds, 
we started our licensing business well before I came in the late 1990s, actually even earlier than that. But it was very, very um, nascent at the time. And we probably had several hundred patents. Uh, and the, the players we were licensing back then, we started with AT&T and Motorola, Motorola, who were two big players there. Right. We negotiated arm's length a licensing agreement for those key patents. This was the CDMA technology. Right. And we set in those agreements basically a, uh, a royalty rate that was approximately 5% of the selling price. That has not changed huh. in all this time, except for the fact that the rate has gone down. The rate has huh. gone down. And we did it before we were um, part of the standards body. That is, when you, in, in the mobile communications arena, I have to give a little bit of background. Sure. Everything is controlled by standards, logically. I mean, how could you not have a mobile communications worldwide interoperability without, without standards that are agreed to? Right. And that's been the case for a very long time. Back in that late 90 time frame, when we had introduced the concept of CDMA technology as really the next big step in mobile communications, uh, after quite a fight, because there were entrenched interests which were fighting against that, mostly in Europe. Um, it was the standards body decided to adopt our technology, CDMA. Right. Now, under the standards body's general rules, if your technology is adopted and you have intellectual property, patents in particular, protection on that technology, you have to agree to license that technology. You have to agree to license it on, on um, Fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory terms. What we call brand, your brand. Now you think about it. Back to the IP issue. Patents, by definition, give you an exclusive right. That is to say, I have twenty years, let's say, to exclusively use this invention. I don't have to allow anybody else to use it. That's my patent right. That's the social contract, right. which, by the way, gives the world the ability to see. Uh, the details of this invention and to build on it and to expand on it. Uh, if you agree to license your patent, you're giving up essentially that right to exclude. Right. So for us to both contribute our technology to the standard, give up our right to exclude, and then agree that if we, when we charge for the license that we have to provide, we will charge only reasonable and non-discriminatory terms. We said, look, we've already got established loyalty rates with these companies. We'll just continue those. Now, the antitrust piece of this is very interesting because one of the theories of the antitrust claims is that when you have standard essential patents, that is, your technology is, is a standard in the industry, right. you have the power, now it's the antitrust claim, to abuse your position in those patents, you can, you can, for example, hold up, which has become a popular term, sure. hold up anyone who wants to get a license to your patents by charging them an inordinate, inordinate amount of money or, or nothing or, or not agreeing to license at all. Well, we gave that up. We right. said, no, 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 hold up. We're, we, we're providing the contribution of the technology and we're agreeing to license the patents on, on fair, reasonable and non-discriminatory terms. Uh, yet that's what we've often been accused of, which is the ability somehow to use this patent power beyond what the patent law says you can by, um, as I said, insisting on uh, ro royalty rates that are too high. And there's all kinds of defenses to that that I can talk about, but we don't have enough time. <laughs> um, but that's the, that's the intersection there of the competition law notion theory and the and the uh, IP royalties for patents. You, you, you mentioned the you know big beneficiaries of that uh, being uh, Samsung and LG, for example, in, in uh, the most recent iteration of this. Um, and, and as you said, it, it, it may be a little bit odd to think of, of the US government sort of intervening on their their behalf um but that kind of intervention isn't 
um, uh, maybe unfortunately, doesn't seem to be such a rarity in a lot of places. Um, maybe even in the U.S., I mean, I'd be interested in your take on on whether there is a kind of, and I'll, obviously what I'm getting at is industrial policy, whether there is a sort of industrial policy behind some of um, U.S. antitrust law. But uh, but there's no there's no it's not hidden in in a lot of places. Um, and I and if I understand it right, I think Qualcomm has really been at the kind of center of a lot of that, um, a lot of countries' efforts to enact a kind of industrial policy for the benefit of their uh, domestic industry. I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that and, and in general, but also in, in the U.S., the relationship between that kind of industrial policy and, and antitrust enforcement. Yeah, I look, I, I know you, I've often talked about my concerns about um, uh, really using antitrust competition law uh, as, an, as an industrial policy tool. Uh, I complained about that rather vociferously <laughs> during the course of a couple of the, um, the uh, competition challenges in Asia, uh, okay. whether it was in Korea or, or um, China, as I alluded to before, when you think about uh, using the competition laws as basically a price regulating tool, uh, and you think about why you're doing that and what you hope to achieve, it's often the case that what you're doing is essentially is, is using it to um, further industrial policy designs. Um, and you know, in the case of China, again, not to pick on China because there's a lot of positives to add to that as well, but sure. there I, I viewed it as um, at the time, attempts to uh, promote uh, and support uh, the indigenous uh, players, industry. And, um, and if you could lower the royalty rates, uh, then you could support Chinese device manufacturers who presumably would be able to uh, uh, either earn more profits because they don't have to pay you as much or, um, or do something else with that with those funds. And one of the arguments the Chinese often made was the Chinese companies are not like US or even European companies, profit margins are pretty slim. Uh, and I, I used to, I, it used to be an interesting argument, but at the end of the day, I would kind of chuckle about it because it was true, profit margins are, are slim, they didn't have to be, <laughs> but also why does that entitle you to take my property? Uh, and I often use the example of if I had a widget that I invented and I'm the only one who could make it now because I had uh, uh, capabilities beyond what anybody else had, it was my, it was my widget. Right. Uh, you would pay me the price for that piece of hardware if you needed it to create your device and you'd figure out how to price your device so that you could recover your costs. What's the difference between a widget and a valuable patent on on technology that you find essential to manufacture of your product, uh, figure out how to how to deal with the cost of that. Right. And as I indicated before, it's amazing to me. It, it continuously is amazing to me that in you know regulatory cases and apples our Apple litigation, th this notion of uh, of our price our royalty rate being too high. In the face of profit margins, and in many cases that were ridiculous, uh, was just silliness. And we we often compared uh, how much it would cost for you, for example, to buy a connector for a device versus how much you pay for uh, the intellectual property that we were licensing to you. By the way, I alluded to the fact that in the very beginning we probably had several hundred patents. We now have a hundred and forty thousand patents and or patent applications. And almost all of them are included in our, certainly the mobile communications part of that, which is enormous, are included in our license to a device maker. So, and when you think about it, think about how that has dropped prices because sure. even if I was still at 5%, which I'm not, I'm lower. But back then I was charging 5% for a couple of hundred patents and now I'm charging 5% for 140. You can yeah. do the math better than I can. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we've actually lowered the price. Uh, right. Uh, so, um, and and is it? 
so uh, that's obviously true for uh, those who, who have to purchase the license. Um, I'm wonder, I wonder if you talk a little bit about how, well, here, I was going to say this, the, the, we're, we have some experience with industrial policy around more tangible goods. I mean, that, that's sort of been something, uh, especially around things like oil and steel and, and things like that. Um, it seems like now it really is uh, about intellectual property, about intangible uh, goods. That my you know, casual sense is that um, in places that are adopting a sort of industrial policy approach, that's what they're most concerned about. They're most concerned about innovation and technology in their, country, in their country. But I presume they're not just concerned about those who are purchasing uh, intellectual property. They're probably also concerned about ensuring a domestic industry to create intellectual property. Um, yeah. How how do you how has that uh, sort of played out, especially with respect to, to Qualcomm? I, I I can imagine a lot of ways that, that would be problematic, but, um, but well, over, yeah, sorry. Over over my um, my thirteen years here, uh, I have actually been, as a general proposition, extremely pleased with the direction, overall direction, there's been some ups and downs of intellectual property protection around the world. Um, take China, for example, I'm, I'm going back there, but I'll, I'll use other examples. I, it was probably a dozen years ago when I, when I went over there, uh, made a speech, uh, invited to make a speech to all, what were called all the IP enforcers, every, every intellectual property right, and some judges and others. And I remember being very blunt saying, if you um, expect uh, to be more than the manufacturer to the world at some point, which I know you do, and you right. want to become known as an innovator, um, one important thing to do is to respect intellectual property rights as they exist now elsewhere around the world, because at some point in time, you're going to want your intellectual property rights to be protected. Right. And of course, lo and behold, they've made enormous strides. I mean, you look at Huawei in our industry, for example, they're one sure. of the major uh, uh, filers of patents, not only in China, but around the world. Uh, and they're not the only ones. Um, and they have built up, uh, I spent a lot of time with the um, patent authorities in China over the years. They have enormous, just as US IP people do, have enormous respect for intellectual property rights. And they have built up a good system of intellectual property protection. And to give you another example, now it's not perfect. I, I, I oh, maybe I'll allude to something, but um, when I was, we were strategizing about our Apple challenge. You know, we we were involved. Uh, thankfully, now we're back being a, a partner to Apple, but we were involved in some real difficulties for quite a few years, which ultimately resolved itself. But um, one of the ways we got to resolution because was frankly, we were throwing, throwing darts at each other and they started, I would say. <laughs> but um, one of the strategies that we had was, well, we're gonna have to hit back. And we chose to bring a bunch of patent cases and specifically chose not to use standard essential patents. I didn't wanna muddy the water with all the issues and baggage associated with standard essential patents. I didn't want to hear the antitrust arguments. I didn't want to hear a lot of the other. Uh, so we chose what we call our non-standard essential patents. These are just what are called regular patents, regular patents. Yeah. Uh, that we felt they were infringing. And I sued in two different places, or well, actually three. I, we did bring a case or two in uh, in the um, in the United States in the, in the uh, court here, but. Two primary places, Germany and China. Why? Because both of them had demonstrated not only respect for intellectual, for strong respect for intellectual property, but the courts were very willing, once validity and infringement were established, to issue orders of injunctive relief. And as those of you who have spent any time thinking about IP in, in the US, you know, we've gone through a period of time over the last 15 years or so where it's really difficult to get an injunction because of the eBay case and its progeny. 
Uh, and you could argue, you know, whatever way you want to argue is whether that's good or bad. But the point is, a big company, uh, a wealthy company, doesn't really fear the damage uh, order in a patent infringement case. What they do fear is injunctive re relief, which could stop them from shipping their products. Right. And it worked. We got injunctions in both China and Germany. I mean, you think about where China has come to it, it, really, really quite, quite extraordinary. Uh, and the same, I would say, is generally the path. Now, I spent years before, in the early years, well, from actually early to middle, we were also battling in the US uh, the notion of patent reform. That was a big fight for years we were on. And we were, again, kind of the, the weaker side of, of, the, of the argument. Most people, or big companies, were arguing for more patent reform, which essentially meant uh, don't let patent uh, holders charge as much and, you know, and, and, uh, and have so much power. Um, but it also, it was, uh, it, it was unfortunately conflated with a lot of real concern, for example, about uh, trolls, you'll recall, and uh, an abuse of the patent litigation process. And so we argued for years in Washington about, look, let's, let's use a, a scalpel and not a cleaver. We can fix the problems with litigation abuse in patent law, but we don't have to change the patent law substantively that we hurt innovation, especially in this, in this time frame. And ultimately, we, we managed to, um, I think, uh, get legislation which effectively did that and didn't, didn't go too far. Uh, and so that was a success here as well. Um, but it's, it's a constant battle everywhere, by the way. It's, we're we're going to continue to have these challenges uh, to patent rights. And as I say, in particular for us, I think it will be in the standard essential patent area. Although I would, I would argue and hope that the FTC decision that we've talked about uh, has really set a new standard, so to speak, for, um, for how one analyzes uh, the concept of competition issues, antitrust issues, in the context of the kind of IP that we were talking about there. Uh, uh, we, uh, we have only about five minutes left, so I, I want to ask one uh, probably final uh, question, but it, it relates to this idea of reform. Um, uh, but I want to bring it back to competition and ask you about, uh, there, there seem to be a lot of efforts to reform competition law uh, out there right now. Um, certainly in the U.S. and, and in Europe, and um, uh, I, I, I'm not as convinced that the direction of that reform will be something about which you ultimately say, well, you know, we we managed to achieve something that that was an appropriate sort of reform. Um, but maybe the impetus is kind of the same here. There, there's a sense that that enforcement is too difficult, litigation is too expensive. Um, there's a lot else, with a lot of this sort of populist sentiment involved as well. But then you see the proposals like the DMA in Europe and the, uh, Senator Klobuchar's bill in the US, the House Judiciary Committee in the US uh, report. And they don't look modest or, or particularly um, economically well informed. Um, how do you think that, I, I, I'm pretty sure I know your view on those proposals themselves, but how do you, how do you think, um, what, what do you think is behind this and what do you think is going to come of it and, and how, how will it affect companies like yours, but not just your company, I imagine smaller companies and totally different companies as well. Um, what are your concerns there? How do you see the future of competition policy shaping up? In let, me, let, me see if I, let me see if I can, uh, in a few minutes, get in a couple of points, uh, realizing that because I'm limited, um, I don't, I, I don't want to paint this as the whole picture. There's a lot of comparisons. Yes. There's, there's a lot of issues here. Very good. I, I, I would say as a general matter, and I, I looked at uh, the developments in the US, in Europe, and in China, by the way. And it's interesting, there is a common theme, as you know, which is all about, frankly, platforms uh, and so-called gatekeepers, which I, I could say, on the one hand, that's fine with me because, um, 
it's good that they're focused on somebody other than someone else. <laughs> Uh, and uh, so, so, but on the other hand, um, I am concerned. Uh, I, I understand the need to take a good hard look at, at the platforms and the practices that have been followed. And I frankly can be convinced, even as an antitrust defense lawyer, that there are things that need somehow to be corrected or at least uh, uh, prevented and, and changed. Mm -hmm. Um, but I'm a little concerned as I, I, I talked about scalpel and cleaver before, and I think a lot of people are using this language, although I've been using it for a while. I'm a little concerned about that same approach um, on modifying our or amending our competition laws. As a general proposition, I'm concerned that the Cloverture Bill, for example, uh, does go too far in certain areas. I'm concerned about the whole, the notion, for example, the obvious one for me is not really caring about market definition. I mean, as an antitrust lawyer, uh, you know, I, I always used to, I taught antitrust for a while. I used to say, you know, the first, first thing you have to do is define the market. And by the way, once you define the market, that could be the end of the case, right? But now there's this, this concept of, well, you don't really have to define the market in most, in most cases, which, which troubles me. I'm troubled uh, by some of the, a lot of the language on the merger side. Um, uh, and that, by the way, goes to this question of uh, restricting innovation to some extent. Because yeah, I understand, and I, I've seen some of the, um, the testimony or internal documents, for example, by Mark Zuckerberg, which, uh, which talked about basically wanting to acquire certain companies while, while they were um, in their early stages so that they, they won't uh, grow to be too competitive and will be able to capture that area. That's, that's obviously stuff that needs to be looked at very carefully. Um, on the other hand, as we know, uh, there's a lot of companies out there who start and are looking for uh, the ability to, to merge, to be acquired. Um, uh, it, it's a way of taking technology. You know, I, I've seen many times in my IP uh, advocacy days, Individual inventors, small companies, um, they often have the inability have an inability to um, to really take and monetize the intellectual property that they develop. They need either investment or they need combination. Right. And I'm not saying it's 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 always the, the way to, to to do this, and everybody wants that. But I think we have to be careful that we don't put limits on that while we're trying to correct the bad behavior. I actually am. I'm pretty impressed by the European DMA and DSA and, and what I've read uh, that they've published in terms of how they want to approach this. It's, it's much more, I think, directed at the specific problems that are perceived with platforms mm -hmm. um, than, I, than I read the, the, uh, the US uh, proposed legislation is. I also, interestingly enough, like the Chinese, um, legislation, or at least uh, proposals that are coming out, which are very specifically by name directed at platform. And, and just to juxtapose this one point about market definition, they clearly reject the notion of not having to define the market, which I think is phenomenal. You know, when I started practicing, there were basically two antitrust jurisdictions in the world that we worried about as businesses. It was US and Europe. Now there are 140 or so and often people worry about, in particular, China or Korea. And China is kind of, in my opinion, leaping ahead. In t and, and we have 130 years of antitrust jur jurisprudence. They have about 10. Right. So um, they seem to be developing there as quickly as, they, as they've done everything else over the last 40 or so years. Um, but it's very interesting to me. And their focus is we see the problems with the platforms, the same things that are being articulated here in the US and Europe. Let's, let's focus on how to fix those problems. And I'm not saying any one of these, whether it's Europe or China, have good answers at the moment. I, I'm, this is going to require a lot of discussion and a lot of careful thought. But I think as you said before, I worry uh, in the US again, for example, that there's, there's this tendency now to move away from what I thought was very important, which is uh, people call it Chicago School economics, 
being a very key factor, unlike what it was I alluded to in the IBM days, for example, uh, uh, while people were looking at, well, what did you write down rather than what's the act, what are the actual effects? And, um, and um, you know, consumer welfare. I, I, I think that we have to not lose that major uh, policy orientation that we went to uh, in our competition law um, uh, governance. And um, the other thing I worry about is throwing away this 130 years worth of uh, jurisprudence. I mean, th anybody who's done anything in antitrust law and studied antitrust law knows this is a complicated area of the law. Uh, and there have been a lot of cases uh, dealing with the complexities. Yeah. Uh, you know, you started with a Sherman II Act that says basically every com contract combination and conspiracy and restraint of trade is illegal. Okay, that means every contract is illegal, I guess. But it was the courts who said, no, you know, it's got to be unreasonable and then and develop from there. This is important stuff. And, and some of the stuff I read in, in the uh, bills associated with Klobuchar and, and, and the Congress also um, seem to want to just throw that, that away and, and start afresh. And what I think they're not, they're not thinking clearly enough about is it doesn't just happen like that. You don't just create legislation and then it's, it's there. You know, there's lots of rhetorical flourishes. They all sound good. But the system says you've got to test those things, right? And so what are you going to have now? You're going to have the courts now creating new rules under the, under the in, in, consistent with these, the new legislation as opposed to the old? Yeah. And where does that take you? How long does it take to develop? I think there are a lot of things that need to be thought out very carefully. Uh, and, you know, I suspect, for example, Senator Klobuchar knows that as well. I, it, you know, bills are interesting processes. You put them on the table and, and you know there's going to be a lot of give and take. And discussion. The end. Yeah. But I just hope that discussion is, is carefully thought through uh, and all, all facets are, are examined. That's great, John. I, uh, I am sad to say, I would love to continue for another several hours, but I'm sad to say that we have to. We have to quit now. I want to thank you so much for, for your insights. Um, I thought this was really interesting. And as I said, we could talk about it for another couple of hours. <clears throat> and if you ever write a book, I think I would well, I'll certainly be the first one to buy it. But I will be okay, well, I'll give that some time. <laughs> um, for everyone else, uh, stay tuned for um, uh, the, the day continues. Um, we have uh, business strategy in an uncertain world with David Teese at 6.40 p.m. Uh, Nobilis Vernon Smith on Adam Smith at 8.20 p.m. And uh, closing out the day at 10.20 p.m., a panel on U.S. and Chinese tech policy and foreign policy in the 2020s. So stay tuned for all of that. And once again, thanks so much, Don. Jeffrey, thank you so much, too. I, I really appreciate it. Uh, I, too, would have loved to have had more time to engage. Thank you again. Thanks. Sir.